<laughs> you know, hey. so greetings, everybody. Uh, you all hey, greetings, um, in the energy and spirit of Black history, who Jumbo Jumbo, which is Swahili for hey, what's going on, Habaragani, what's going on, right? Hello, what's going on? So, welcome, everybody. This is another edition of a discussion between myself, Kyle Dixon, your host and Professor David Kelly, uh, entrepreneurship, educator, philanthropist, <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> all right. So uh, we're going to jump right in, you all. This is Black History Month. And of course, we know Black History is every day. Uh, but in the scope of Black History Month, we have to recognize the achievements and the accomplishments of Africans in America, but also Africans abroad, those of, of the African diaspora, meaning those people who are from the continent of Africa but who have been dispersed throughout the entire world. Um, and this, this is a good topic to talk about because we're gonna talk about today careers, right? Careers, you know, you're young, gifted, and you're black. So what career or what my job or occupation should be going forward for my life, my lifestyle, my mm -hmm. livelihood, my family's livelihood, et cetera. So Professor yeah. uh, Kelly and I want to talk about that today. So what's up, Professor Kelly? Good day, sir, how you doing? <laughs> We never could talk enough about careers because, you know, careers are the one thing that we really don't plan, but yet we, we assume we're planning it, you mm -hmm. know? So you may go to school and say, I want to be X, Y, and Z, right? Um, and then right. you may even get into the field, but, you know, fast forward five or 10 years later, you're not in that field. The average person does not go to school and work in the same environment, you know? So you go to school for, let's say, engineering, and mm -hmm. what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing the accounting work for my job, or I'm doing case management, or I'm, I became mm -hmm. a nurse instead, or a doctor, or something like that, as opposed to just following that too. But the, the problem with career is that we don't have enough information from the onset. You know, A lot of us don't go into the internship that we need to somewhere in high school to see if we like it. But then again, the biggest question is, are you prepared for a career in high school? Should you be talking about a career in high school? Right. Or should you be talking about a career once you get to your third um, year in college? That's actually where you want to think about a career at that point. But yeah. I think high school is a little bit too premature because a lot of things transpire in high school. You know? What happens between the ninth and the third year of college? A lot. You know. So if you say you want to be something, it's nice to be focused and say, have that laser focus is a, be a beautiful thing, but most of us don't. You know, by the time we get to our third year of college, the reason why I say third year is because that's where you have to determine your major at that point. You know, okay. and um, you, 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 you really just you locked in. You know, mm -hmm. and you say something that you really don't like, or, or you do like most of us do. We go in the career because it pays the most money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, you gotta get the bag. As I say, gotta get the bag. You know, the bag. Yeah, I'm going in this career because if it, I don't care if I'm good at it or not, and some of us are not good at it. Yeah. Some of the better people in the world are not in the fields they need to be in. I think we had that conversation in the past. You know, yeah, most gifted individual are not in the fields they need to be in. And I was uh, talking to a couple of graduate schools earlier this morning, and the question was about the survey. I was introducing the surveys and how surveys can be used to. Um, to get an idea as to what's going on with the population they wanted to serve or an issue they wanted to get involved with. And they struggle with the survey. And I have to show them sure. that all surveys must be tested. You know, the tools must be tested before mm -hmm. you can actually use that survey. And the survey's gotta be vetted out, you know, for any kind of issues that, that may be, um, you know, conflicting in regards to the goals that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we went over that and then, a career was a part of that survey. What field you want to be in, you know, and then based on their surveys and their results will dictate what is their strong suits are. And most people want to be in certain areas, but based on their surveys, it, that's not for them, you know. And that don't, I yeah. think that comes in reality like later on in life, you know. Right, uh, right. And I want to, I want to chime in on what you were saying. Uh, with the uh, career choices in high school or high school level versus well not even versus just in, in, in just a position to college level because you know as we come up in age and, and mature people are like you know what do you want to be that's the key question what do you want to be in life you know what do you want to do and it's just like uh and then sometimes adults in the past have chastised us uh in, in youth even currently 
like you don't know what you want to do like what's like what's wrong with you you know mm -hmm. and you're saying that it should really be chosen more so in the college level than the high school level could you kind of go into that because yeah because you know, of the, the curriculum a high school curriculum is nothing more than practice you know you're practicing the concepts of chemistry physics biology writing skill sets you know you know you did different types of writing styles you know and uh, you may even deal with sports or do a, it's a little bit of everything going on in high school you know and at that point it's great yeah. to you know, if you if you have the laser laser focus to be able to choose it, great. But most of us don't, you know. So by by the time you get to college, that first or second year of college, you're taking basic, you know, introductory courses the first and second year. But by the time you get to that third year, you should know exactly what you want to do because you had mm -hmm. enough social, you had enough um, academic or professional exposure. Because I'm pretty sure they would have done an internship somewhere in that sophomore year, like most colleges. I don't know what I went to. We was in an internship by our second year. And the second the internships were basically what you want to do, you know. And once you work there, you're looking at how much these people are getting paid, you know, what they work like, look like. You know, I know when I was in college, a good example of that, when I was in my second year, I was um, in a science program, right? And um, right. so my job was basically to go out and learn about the health field and the research field, you know, because that's mm -hmm. what they needed the most people in the health field and research, research field and medical field, nurses and things like that. So I went in there, I did my thing, and um, I was drawing blood. I was doing all the stuff that most people do to get assessments on patients. And I realized mm -hmm. that the guy that I was shadowing, he was a physician, but his car did not move in two days. He had a nice car. That's one of the reasons why mm -hmm. I noticed it. He had a nice car. <laughs> right, like, car. Okay. Like he just called, and I go and come back on two different days, and that car is still there. I'm like, yo, what's going? On? Did you leave? He said, nah, I didn't leave the hospital. I had to stay here because we had these type of. I'm like, whoa, I don't want to drive like that. <laughs> you know? I want a job that's going to allow me to go home every day. You know? Yeah. So the work was great and had good outcome, but the idea of uh, of isolating into a hospital and providing services and you your personal life is suffered. You know. So I yeah. chose to do the research route, which was a better route for me because it gave me a chance to travel. It gave me a chance to interface with other sectors of the profession, which is the social service, the mental health, the um, people who may be in other business worlds and entities, because you have to raise funding, you have to seek out funding from, you know, National Institute of Health or CDC, wherever the funders may be, you have to seek those people out. And they're looking at it from an accounting perspective. So you're basically coming across yeah. a large diaspora of things that may affect just your research project. But when you was in the medical, it wasn't that at all. It was basically assessing and providing treatment and then follow up care. And that was it. And I thought that was great for those who wanted to do it, but I didn't want to do that. I thought research was a better way to go. And it did that. And even though I did that for a period of time, I realized that, you know, you outgrow a, a field, you know? Mm. you know, you have a family, um, you have a wife and kids, and you can't be on the road like you want to be. You have to be home every day. You don't want your kids to, you know, not have dad around. So mm -hmm. I had to switch up, and do something a little bit more local. And then that gave me an opportunity to go into a whole new field of education. You know, I never thought about being an, an educator, working with college students or high school students. I never thought about that in my life. I didn't think that I was a great educator, you know? Mm -hmm. But that opened. And then even in there, <clears throat> I branched out to another career of real estate. And that happened because we was looking for a house. <laughs> like most people do, for right. a house. Time to buy a house. So in buying a house, we went to a couple of seminars and talked to people about you know managing properties and what types of properties and what your money can afford. Basically. And they brought me into real estate. A whole different set had nothing to do with research, had nothing to do with medicine, have everything to do with you know economics and practicality, mm -hmm. you know. And then you realize you do the same thing. It's all about managing money, managing time, managing energy, managing people. And it's a totally different environment. So when I talk to um, kids about careers, um, they have to have an out. You know, you're here, but what is your out? Your out could be this or that, you know? They should have an option. 
And those options should allow them to grow in that person. Even though I do, I still talk about the health field and health, I, I'm, you know, still dealing in the health field. Right. But the thing that gets me the most in the health field is that I can apply the concepts across the span. You know, I can apply. I can say, give a good a good example would be we going through these retrofits right now. Mm -hmm. We going from a retrofit from an oil burner to a clean energy and also these in these apartments right here, right? So we're going through these retrofits and right. they have and everything to do with the because Kevin, let me inject. So retrofit, when you talk about retrofit, because you know, I know what you're talking about, but like, you know, given the context. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. A, retro, a retrofit is basically changing from one substance to another. So for example, let's say you got an empty apartment, right? Right. So we're talking about real estate. Yo. We're talking about real estate. Yeah, in real estate, you got an empty apartment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, get, you got an apartment that people living in is but it's an old 1920s like this one is an old 1920s construction right so what they do is they come in and they rip it out all the walls all the ceilings all the floors they just rip it all out i mean you bring it down to a shell and then you bring it back you may even change the layout of the place change take out mm -hmm. the plumbing take out the electricity everything goes everything goes you bring it down to the studs and the bricks and at that point, you reintroduce new, I mean, new um, flooring, new ceilings, new plumbing, new electricity, and all the other stuff. That's what we call a complete retrofit. And what you're also doing is you're putting in things that are healthy as opposed to things that are harmful. So, for example, you're not bringing in gas heat or oil heat. You're bringing in electric heat. You're bringing in thermostats that is able to control the air flows of the apartment or whatever it may be so there's clean ears there are also are, are filters in the air that allow these people to breathe you know clean air and most people take it for granted that oh we know we've been raised on um gas heat or something like that but gas heat is very terrible for the body itself and um oil heat is even worse you know but the idea is that um we come from an environment of that so um, I try to get back to my point is I try to introduce science in real estate. You know, even though I'm doing real estate, there's a scientific aspect of it as well. There's an economic aspect of it as well. There's a social, there's an emotional aspect of it as well. So mm -hmm. even though you're in one field, you try to bring in other things to help people understand certain concepts. Because the people don't some people don't know that what they're doing is wrong. And when you introduce a concept to them or an idea to them, they go, Oh, I didn't know that. I have a one store. I have a leg. I was in a lab a, a couple of weeks ago. Actually, I was in the gym, and I um, getting time into the gym, and I was, he was like, "Oh, how you doing?" I said, "Who are you?" He said, "I'm in your lecture." <laughs> are you really? <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. No? So, yeah, I know. And I, I remember he said something that, that stuck with me. I said, "What did I say?" <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you talk, you a lot of people in there, and. You say things, but you don't know what you're saying sometimes, you know? But what he said is that, you know what? He said you made reference to something about the thermostats and keeping the temperature slightly cold in the wintertime in your home. And I was like, oh, yeah. But what I was talking to him about was um, in the winter months, mm -hmm. we tend to, you know, expose ourselves to a lot of terrible chemicals in the winter months. More so in summer, but more in the winter mm -hmm. as well. Summer too, but more so in the winter. The key is when you put on heat, when you cook and your windows are closed, you're really exposing yourself mm -hmm. to dangerous toxins, as well as the fact that um, the heat in the home is above 68 degrees or 65 mm -hmm. degrees. In my opinion, 65 is a little bit just to cut off, you know? And I said, if you turn the temperature down, if you don't turn the temperature down, you will feel a whole lot better in your home. Let mm -hmm. me say, oh, but I'm gonna be cold. I said, don't put on a sweater. You know, put on a sweater if you're cold, but the idea is that cold temperature allows people to breathe better, breathe easier, especially when they're at home. But if you turn the temperature up, um, it can cause some breathing problems like asthma, bronchitis, things like that. You know, people tend to dehydrate at home in the winter time because your home is too hot and you're not drinking enough water. And it is what it is. You got these things called osmoreceptors. These osmoreceptors that we have in our body, they tend to shut off in the winter. And that's one of the reasons why we don't drink water in the winter because of those things. And uh, but they come alive in the, in the summertime. So the idea is that he was bringing that up, and I'm like, wow, I remember bringing that up. But whoa, thank you. 
you know, but those are little things that, that we can benefit from that in other careers, you can bring other theories in that career. I don't know how it is in um, maybe accounting or engineering, but I see it in other fields. It makes yeah. sense because you're forced to, you know, grapple with the realities of technology. You know? And technology yeah. is for us to be used appropriately, not to be abused, you know? So, yeah. No, I mean, you said a lot. And um, what, what what came to mind when you were talking was like applicable skills, what they call applicable or stackable skills, mm -hmm. uh, things that you can take like from one profession or one career or one job. You know, you know, like you mentioned internships, you know, it's funny because, you know, when I graduated back in 2001, uh, I really wasn't I wasn't really aware of internships and how important they were. I knew that they existed to a certain degree. But it was more so like like my summer job was working at a pizza shop one summer. You know, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about hard work and how to make pizzas and and and, and uh, supply supply chain. I learned I learned that by just being around the people, uh, because you know the person that hired me was one of the part owners. So, well, part owners and managers. So I learned things through just observing the environment, but. You know, I would have rather had worked at like a law office, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. but because I wasn't fully aware of how important internships were or even how to apply, you know, back then that was not the norm. Now that's the norm. Get an internship, get a get a mentor or what I call Jack, you know what I'm saying? Get those, get, get, get around those people and get into those spaces. But, yeah. you know, what about the student who doesn't know how to even go that far? Like you said, how to take a skill from another job and apply it to another job that's going to yield them more results you know, physically, financially, and even maybe even like uh, emotionally, you know, as far as them enjoying it. Exactly. But the key is there's a program called Inroads. Did you have Inroads when you was in college? You familiar with Inroads? Inroads. I do remember Inroads. I do remember Inroads, yeah. So Inroads was what we had in college. And then they had um, Nesby. You familiar with Nesby? Nesby, yeah. Um, I, have, I have a few friends part of Nesby. Yeah. Yeah. So they had all of these organizations. Um, Minority-based organizations, primarily, and it was designed for just what you're saying to give internships in certain areas. Because I was in the science field and I was at a low-tier school, you got to remember there's higher tier and there's lower tier schools, and we don't like to talk about it. For yeah, most let's talk about it. <laughs> no, for most of your, yeah, your big schools are like uh, B-level schools. You know, mm -hmm. A level schools are be let's be blatantly honest about this, are your mm -hmm. Ivy League institutions. And we there's enough research to show that most of the research that are cutting edge that has effect in our society is coming from these Ivy League institutions. We know that. Yeah. Most of the reports that are coming out, most of the PA, most of the Nobel Prize and the PhDs who are doing great work all over the world are coming from these institutions. Mm -hmm. Now, not to say that you can't get a B-level or C-level school that can produce um, Nobel Prize winners or some PhDs or MDs who are doing cutting-edge work that benefit society. Not to say that they don't, but the larger majority, mm -hmm. based on the report that I've seen maybe a couple of years ago, came out of these Ivy League institutions, primarily Harvard. Primarily mm -hmm. Harvard is producing some of the better research, and we know that to be the case. But yeah. is it biased? I'm pretty sure there's implicit bias somewhere around there. Yeah. Is it favoritism? I'm pretty sure it is. But the fact remains, this is where it's coming from, right? Now, moving that idea further ahead, now you say inroads. Inroads are primarily dealing with minority students or opportunities, giving them opportunities to go into these areas. And particularly myself, I was um, in a health field or a science program. And I had a choice between going into the ocean or working on a leche farm. I chose the leche <laughs> farm. <laughs> I was not going anywhere in the ocean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. And then on the farm, you learn a lot of things like husbandry. Husbandry and farming is a lot of work. I did a, a milk farm. We did a, a lot of pregnancies. A lot of deliveries, uh, a lot of milking, and you learn a lot, a lot about agronomy, how to feed the feed, how to create feed, how to grow it and create uh, and mix the feed. Because mm -hmm. the feed is not what you think it is. Not just hey, it's a little bit of everything in there, you know. Yeah. The purpose of a silo, mm -hmm. how to put together a silo and make sure that the feed is properly mixed in the silo and all this other stuff. That took mm -hmm. like maybe seven, eight weeks over the course of a summer, but it also gave me an idea 
of something that I never knew. I'm coming out of an urban setting. I don't know right. anything about husbandry. Husbandry is something that I thought it was a husband. No, husband had to do right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Husband, like on the farm? Okay, all right. Yeah. So yeah. it gave me an opportunity to do something that I never thought about, but it changes your personality. Once mm -hmm. bitten, you always going to be familiar with that concept. So I was always interested in the idea of how you can cross fertilize theories and thoughts. And that's one of the benefits mm -hmm. of being able to have that skill set is to cross fertilize, to be able to say, I have a little bit of this and I have a little bit of that. And you can master it. You know, yeah. you can master a lot of these things because I think that's one of the reasons why I made a great leap into real estate is because I was able to use practical skills, regular practical skills. Theoretical practical skills that I had maybe from a physics course or a, um, a chemistry course and apply that in engineering. Because property management is about engineering. You talk about boiler repairs and boiler mm -hmm. maintenance. You're talking about roofing materials, be it a rubber or any kind of paper-based roof or something like that. You're talking about bricks and mortar. You're talking about structures. You talk about foundations. You talk about a lot of these things. You talk to, and then you, and the sad thing about it, you're talking about the people, how to communicate with people, how to deal with people from different walks of life. That's a skill set all to itself, you know? So inroads was a design just for that to give the student an opportunity to be able to branch out into areas that they normally wouldn't. And then, you know, the only thing that I did not like about it is that it was putting these people into jobs, but it wasn't putting them into areas of independence. You know, in retrospect, you was getting this guy a job. Basically, a high-level right. hunter. That's all it was. So you make him an engineer, give him a bachelor's or a master's degree, he become an engineer. You gonna make one hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year, and that's his life. You serious? As opposed <laughs> to, he has more dynamics than just that. There's a lot more going on with this guy. But the fact that he's locked into one hundred and sixty thousand a year. He may have a wife or a mortgage or something like that. Very few people are walking away from 160000 in a mortgage. They're going to sit there and they're going to die with that. And that's what we have seen yep. since the 1950s and 60s. That's exactly what we have seen. We have not seen people you know, progressively move into areas and become successful other than our entertainers. Who I think are just, you know, they're just like, I mean, what are our entertainers? What are they doing for us other than entertaining? <laughs> right. Right, you know? that's what they're supposed to do. But people are looking to them to like, you know, be a leader. And I'm like, look, y'all, y'all looking in the wrong spaces, you know. And I and I've been guilty well, of that too, true. But well, that's what that's what they they looking more like a hustler to me. Because you go, know, let's say you're coming in as an entertainer, and then you you and you got like several businesses going on. You know, that's what they do. They get they come in as entertainers and they get several businesses, and that becomes their stream of income. Nothing is wrong with that. Right. But where is the where is the toolish company? You're teaching us all how to be hustlers. We all don't want to be hustlers. We all don't want to have multiple businesses. We all don't want that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We need diversity. We need variety. And that's who provides those services. Usually the people in our communities looking like the entertainers. You know, our entertainers are usually the leaders of our community, which is not a good look. Right. Is, I, don't, I don't think it's a good look. You know? But it was but it was I don't, I don't need in the whole you know but the idea is you have um, wow yeah. so uh, it's starting to interject. So I was start to interject because I want I want to go into like what you were talking about with the 160k and I think you're about to go into it but that 160k is very important because we know on the average I think the average medium income for black families is what like 50 thou if that like the average yeah. compared to our mm -hmm. parts to our uh, Caucasian counterparts which is like 160 or 140 or something like that so I want to talk about that because we also talk about like getting the bag or or having a high paying salary, but there's a there's a opportunity cost to that too, right? You get the 160k, which for the most part takes care of most of your financial needs, your your physical needs, you know, the food, clothes, shelter, family, but no one really doesn't talk about. It. They're talking about it now, starting to, but like you mentioned, the opportunity cost of making 160k when you can do so much more. Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, the idea is this. Let's say I have a, a lot of our colleagues are making mm -hmm. 160K and they're locked into that. And that, you know, we at this point of retirement, so we're looking at life a little bit differently now. But they spent the last 20, 30 years in that field doing this work, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, what it does is it, it, it has an effect on your personality. 
your goals, your dreams and hopes, because you have to remember, you're spending a good eight, maybe 10 to 15 hours a day either thinking about or actually working, working, you know, especially my attorney friends, they spend a lot of available hours thinking about the work they're doing and actually actually doing the work, putting together briefs, you know, and they give them a decent salary, you also get a decent bonus. But what about the um, the other things that you thought that was interesting, like investment banking, you know, or something that else that could be like, um, you know, investing in um, aeronautics, something like that, or investing your time in, you know, agronomy or farming or whatever you may be. It could be anything. But the idea is that there's an alternative to a person, but they can't leave the plantation because they tie to it in this way. And then what is the benefit of a person who's 60, 70 years old who spent the rest of their life, all their life, most of their life working? What can they impart to a person who's coming up other than the fact that they worked for 30 years at a company, you know, and, but never took a chance to strike out and did something on their own? Where's the story to that person's life other than this, you know? And that's what we encourage you. And the thing that we are struggling with as being living in America, we are forced to choose one. You know, when in fact we have more than one talent, the average person have on average seven to eight different talents, according to something I read a, a few years ago. The average person have seven to eight different talents, varying from, I mean, from communicating to art to anything, to manual skills, the average person, have, but we only realize one at any given time. You know, and I think that's maybe some of the pushback we have in a society where we get in, we get kind of you know caught up in this idea. I'm working, I'm doing this. But after you finish an eight to ten hour job, do you really want to come home and work on your hobby, or you just want to take take a nap? You know, right? <laughs> Lay down, your rest. Yeah, you know, yeah. you spend eight to ten hours. Uh, you work in six, seven days a week. Sometimes you're not going to have your time to focus on your hobby. And actually, your hobby will eventually fade away. Those skills or desires will eventually go away because you never actualize at any point in time. Mm. So they eventually go away, and then you just become a shell of who you thought you was. You know? So when you're talking about careers, a career should not be something that is stoic. It should be. This is my recommendation. It should mm -hmm. not be something that is stoic. It should be something that involves other things that may be apropos to your career. It must also involve some kind of physical, if not mental, stimulation that goes along with it. And it shows the, the true person of who you are, your artistic that's available to you. And I think you, you see it among our entertainers, but the entertainers are not smart people. That's the sad thing about it. Our entertainers tend not to be very smart people. They tend to surround themselves with smart people, but they are not smart people. And you will see that because they don't, they're not actualizing their, their gifts, the other six or seven gifts that they may have. And usually you find among people who are college educated or a world travel. You don't necessarily have to have a college education, but the only the the, the difference to substitute for, without a college education would be travel. So if you travel and interact with various people, it can personally replace a college education mm. because it gives you the opportunity to see things at a different level. But if you right. fail to get a college education or you fail to travel, then it limits us. And that's who our entertainers are. That's who they are. They are people. And then they, they create these businesses and they, they you know, you know, what are we trying to do as, as, as a group of people? How could have, I never heard of a group of people being led by entertainers, you know, <laughs> in the history of the world, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it just you know, I, I but I get it though because they are in the, they're in the media, so you so we see them, so we have this connection, the visual connection through through the uh, camera, through the TV, through the big screen. So I, I get the psych psychology of it, but it right, it's a it's a false you know, it's yeah. a false hope. You know what I mean? Like because again, they're learning just like we are. They're not too, too dissimilar from who we are, but they're able to have the money and the access to surround themselves with people. Who are and I and I'll give them credit. I'll say, you know, if you know you're not that smart, surround yourself with smarter people than you to kind of give you insight. And I remember us talking about this on a previous video about like with Jay Z and how he learned how to become a businessman by being around people he had access to because he was in the entertainment industry, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or people like a Jay Z or like a Beyonce or or any any other entertainers, you know. At that, could you speak on, um, like I said, traveling if you're not don't have a college degree? 
but like how to access not only the travel, but also how to how to discover one's gifts if you have an opinion on it. How to discover yeah. your gifts or recognize them that you have. Yeah. Because a lot of people say, I have to find, you know, but mm-hmm. it's like it's really not a, a it's not a search. You know, it's yeah. a it's a it's a knowing, you know what I mean? Yeah, the discovery is in the interaction as simple as that. This mm-hmm. discovery is in the physical interaction and it doesn't require any money other than the fact that you get there. You know, so let's say, for example, you may be at the Lou Museum somewhere or something like that, or maybe the Museum of whatever, whatever right? You're right. at this museum and you're looking at a particular piece and you read the little caption they have at the bottom of that piece. And then you you make an expression, but there's other people over your show looking at the same thing. And you'll have a brief conversation around that. And then that can actually extrapolate to something totally different or different. You know, you're basically coming in contact with people who normally you wouldn't do, but you do on a smaller scale. Same thing goes when you go to college. When you go to college, you're going to talk to professors in different departments who have totally different views on life. Same thing with students. You go to a college that has 50,000 students and you're forced to interact with 50,000 different people. Organizations mm-hmm. you may get involved with. That's where the real human capital is all about. The human capital is in a diversity of mind and thought and thinking. And it's not diversity in color because color is just a, a figment of our imagination. There's no such thing as race. There's no mm-hmm. such thing as culture. There's no such thing as ethnicity. It's all about a thing of choice. People choose to do this. That's what they choose to do. And they, you want to call it a culture, but I call it a choice because food is food. You know, you look at Chinese food versus Japanese food, what's the difference? Rice is rice. Mm-hmm. You just different, different herbs, different spices, whatever it is. But the key is that it's the interaction. Once you have proper interaction, and you're able to, um, you know, exhaust those interactions. That because you took that skill, they're going to take you for the rest of your life. I remember I was on a boat one time. I think we was going between one of the Hawaiian islands, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we was looking at the, um, the the machine. I mean, the ship that went down that was blown up on, in 1941. Yeah, Pearl Harbor. Uh, Pearl Harbor. I think. Uh, yeah, Pearl Harbor. We was actually overlooking the boat. Literally goes right over the um, the boat that's in the water. What? So the, the boat is wow. in the water. The one that they blew up. Yeah, it's yeah. still down. You look at it and see it's down there. And the bodies wow. are still in there. So I'm so we're sitting there looking. And um and I noticed that it was as I went back to get my bag and my camera, I noticed I seen an Asian lady um sitting like away from the group. She was just sitting down like this. So I went over to ask, so oh, you gotta go look at she said, No, no, I don't want to. I said, Why not? She said, you know, I'm from Japan and you know how people feel about that. I'm mm. like, wow. You get it? So we had sat there for like a whole hour or two having a conversation with the relationship between Japan and America back in 1941 because Japanese are responsible for that boat being down there, right? So that's their attitude. And she thinks yeah. that we have something. I say, no, we don't have it. Things happen. It happened for a reason other than what happens between you and I because people who are fighting each other don't have a problem. It's the economics or the powers that be that create those problems between us. But there's no real problem between human beings. Human beings love and love and effect, have great affection for each other if given the pros proximity that they need to be in. And mm-hmm. um, that that can help a person grow by being in a diverse environment and not living up to certain standards that you thought that was going to help you because it doesn't necessarily help you. And understand that life is about a movement. You're this today, but you're going to be something else tomorrow. And tomorrow you're gonna be something else and you're gonna move on and you're gonna morph into this and that. That's what makes a person a whole person. The morphing of new things, the inviting of new ideas. And the problem is that we also live in a society where people try to demonize, you stated earlier, keep you in this box because you belong in this box. That's the worst thing a person can ever do to you is to try to keep you in a particular box. Just because you represent what they may thought you represent, that's not where you belong. Mm-hmm. You belong in wherever you want it. You could be in this box today and tomorrow you can be in the next one. And, and that makes you a full being. You feel that way. You tr- If you travel the world, you ever took a, got on a plane and went in any place, you realize that the world is the same as every, oh, there's no difference. Mm-hmm. You know, Tibet is the same as Harlem. They mm-hmm. eat the 
think they go to work. <laughs> Methods may look different, but it's the same situation. Oh, yeah. I want to see how those people live. They live like you live in. They recreate just like you recreate. You know, it may look a little different, but they're doing the same thing. And what we try to do, mm -hmm. oh, those exotic. Ain't no such thing as exotic. They're doing the same thing. If you're living in a mm -hmm. tent versus you living in a building, is that an exotic for you to live in a tent? No, it's just a tent. Same. And that's what they do. They got thatch roofs. They got 10 zinc houses. They just trying to get by like anybody else. Mm -hmm. But that's not the real conversation. Real conversation is how, how are you doing? How's mm -hmm. life going for you? Mm -hmm. And the first thing they would tell you if they're ignorant is make a comparison between their life and your life. I wish I was in America. That's the ignorant conversation. Because what they're going to do when they come to America is become just the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. Get up and work. You know, like I have one student I talk to on a regular basis. He's from, I don't know what country he's from, but his first thing is coming to America for a better life. That is the BS. Because they say they come to America for a better life. You may come here for, you come here to work. You come here to pay taxes. You come in here to become another part of the citizens of the world. We work here. That's what Americans do. We do a lot of work here. And mm -hmm. we do a lot of maintenance of work. We spend a lot of time and energy maintaining that monster of work. That's what we do. And every now and then we get two or three days off of the week and we recreate. But really it's about the work. That's what we do. His attitude is I come to this country for a better life where all I'm doing is working. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm working. I don't recreate and my health has depleted itself. And my health is worse than it was when I was in the old country. <laughs> You need to do that in America. No, it's the, it's, it's, it's the no. basic thing that, that a person would need is the contact of other people, and they would grow. You know? And it, and that wow, that's a great point. Thank you for that because, um, you know, like when we talk about with some of my guys, when we talk about as far as work and purpose, like community, right? Going into like the Kwanzaa principle, one when you were talking, two of them came up was like Ujima, collective work and responsibility, and Ujama, cooperative economics. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, like you said, you're gonna find out if you live life and and, and and cohabitate and connect with people and be around different people, same people, but that community, whether it be the local community, the national or global community, the community is gonna help shape kind of what what you feel like who you are and what you can do and who you can be. But it's just like this whole dynamic, like, like like going back to what you just said, the main question they ask us is what do you want to be, right? Not who do you want to be, what do you want to be? So right then, like you said, with the work dynamic, it goes right back to work. It yeah. goes right yeah. back to work. It's just like, like what do you want to be? Uh, I want to be a fireman. And it's just like work. You know, it's like, and again, like you're saying, you're working a job, but are you really benefiting your own entity? Huh? Where is the you in the job? Where is the you? <laughs> Where is the you? You know, yeah. and I want us to. I want you to talk about like you know you talk about getting a real estate and and applying those skills to different aspects and other interests that you have. How does one begin to even feel like they can do that for themselves? Because a lot of people put entrepreneurship as this like this kind of unknown entity or this kind of large thing. When it's really you know you're not an entrepreneur. Yeah, ideas and finding the systems in order to help facilitate it. Really, you know, that's what it's for me. Simplify. That's what it is. I but never how does left it? anything. I never. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a question. One question, but I never really left the field of interest. Sure. I still do research every day. That's one reason why I came up with those products that I have for the uh, pest repellent and things like that. I still do research on a regular basis. I picked up teaching, but I still teach. I still do manage manage property, but I still man I, I, I still teach and manage property and do research. But you never leave that. You just add in more compartments to the diversity of who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. So the key is that answering your question is how do a person get that? They got to take a step on faith and then realize that if it don't work out, it's okay. The world is set up for you to fail. It is also set up for you to succeed, and we need to know that. We need to tell people that it's okay to fail. But it's also okay to succeed at the same level, you know. And if you if you spend your whole life attempting and failing, that's a good life. You have never accomplished anything, but you attempted. Your whole life was about an attempt. Great, a lot to read about, a lot to talk about. 
But the person who actually had never attempted, just thought about it, God bless your soul, because there's a lot of resentment I can see. You may not want to talk about it, talk about the successes you have. Yeah, you're great, but it's only going to be limited because you never took a leap of faith. And sometimes you have to remember, as I said, you know, that 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 whole concept of severing different skill sets, yeah, is the Egyptian term. That's an Egyptian term. Mm -hmm. that, that comes about the various skill sets these people had because the people who was quarrying those um temples out in in in, in, um, in africa they was more than just quarriers it was more than just slaves you can't be a slave and rise to a, a, a person who's like a templar or king or something like that or pharaoh how you went from a slave to a templar or to a something like that <laughs> and yet they weren't even from those areas they was from like other areas who came in, you know? Yes, it is. And the reason why they did that was because they was able to utilize various skills. They was impressing upon them to use these skills. Take the leap of faith. Try this. Try that. We call them vocational skills. But there's also other things which we call social skills and emotional skills, which is, uh, we call them soft skills. But those right. soft skills are just as important as the hard skills. Equally important. You know, you need to communicate in order for you to drive a hammer, right? So the idea is that you have to have both coming and then continue to grow. You know, who, as my wife hate me when I say this, but reinventing oneself is the greatest gift of God can give you, is to reinvent yourself. And you can mm -hmm. reinvent yourself every single day. And the failure to do so is almost a sin as far as I'm concerned. You mm -hmm. have to reinvent yourself. You have to take a failure. But whatever, I don't know what I want to do. So travel, go onto the road and seek out your interests. You can't stay home, stay in the neighborhood, stay here, make your little local, where you going on vacation to your native land? That's where you go on vacation. And you and you question why you never diversify and see things different because look where you going on your vacation. So if you're from Tibet, you're going to take two weeks to go to Tibet, two weeks to go to Vietnam. You know, that's you. Aren't you from those countries yet? Yeah. There's other countries to go to other than Vietnam and Tibet, you know? But they choose not to. They choose to maintain. And that's one of the reasons why we struggle as a people. And uh, the people who are in position to let us know these things are not letting us know these things, that there's the opportunities that can make us the better people. And, that's, and once a person grows into who they are as a full self, there's less fighting. Mm -hmm. There's less fa fracturing. There's less threatening because the fact is that these people understand everybody has self-worth right mm -hmm. everybody has a gift and how can i attack the person who i know on various stuff you can see the situation we're going through right now in europe when they go about this this crazy what they have in europe you know yeah. you can tell it's one side you can tell they have having tunnel vision you can tell that it's all about green and opportunity have nothing to do with the full experience of the millions of people who are going to be affected by that they don't give a hell about that they care about whatever it is they want to do. And your life is expendable. But if you grow that person on multiple levels, that would never be the case. That would never be the case because a full service individual would never bring their problems to you because they always they, they should know how to handle their problems. But they're not full service people. Thus they come up with deficit. Oh my child got an IEP. My kid can't read. My kid can't do math. Because you presented it wrong, my child. You know, maybe he need a different perspective. You know, I know I'm sorry. I'm going off topic a little bit, but anyway. No, no, no. That's that's completely on topic. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's because the growth of an individual, you realize how diverse you are within yourself. And, and yeah. Martin, Dr. King talked about it. You know, certain philosophers talked about it for centuries. That the the growth and the development of a person allows you to see the depths of you, which allows you to see the depths and humanness of someone else. So it's like, why would I, why would I attack somebody for something or, or something they said or tried to do that was where I used to be? I'm not there anymore, but I recognize it because they're going, they, they're in the process of it. If they're, if they are, you know, they're not just stuck there. They're in the process. But it's just like you, when you went to the full dynamics of you, you recognize how capable we are of really healing ourselves collectively together, right? I feel like you, like you said, like the, the sin. The, the ultimate sin is not living up to your potential. The ultimate sin is basically uh, 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 rendering yourself, oh, I'm just a one, as they may say, a one trick pony. I can only do one thing at one time 
at, in one day. You know, it's like, no, you have more diversity to you. More and dynamic. I think it was, a poor, it was a poor Lawrence Dunbar poem that talks about that. I can never be who I ought to be unless you are who you ought to be. I think that's poor as long as he said that. Meaning that if you fail really? to reach your accomplishments in life, we all suffer as a society of people. So it's a precedent upon you to make sure that you reach your accomplishments in life because we we'll all be better as a people if you do. And that's what that concept is all about. I can't be a better me unless you are a better you. You have to give me that. And that gift comes from you. And that's why we have to divert. And if you have to remember, we are built on a slave society in the United States. It's a slave-based society. We were addicted to cheap labor. We was founded on cheap and free labor. And to this day, we still are But You can look at our minimum wage laws. Why do we have to have minimum wage laws? The mere fact that we have to have a minimum wage law tells me that you have a problem with paying people for services. You know? So the idea is that if you lock a person into a career, you lock them into services, you lock them in, lock them in, lock them in, Therefore, you can keep your energy going, or whatever engine, whatever engine you got going on, keeping this 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 work environment going. On. But this life is more than just work, you know. And, and as one philosopher stated, all that can keep you alive is basically on your on your. He said it was on your path. But back then, that means on your land. You grow fruits and vegetables. You drink water. You stay alive for the rest of your life. You know, all that keeps you alive is right on your patch, which means that. You don't need to work. You don't need to do all this stuff. All of that stuff is right there for you. Fruits and vegetables and water. And you build your own house and that's where you live. And we could not be a part of that movement, you know? And that's yeah. usually how it works, you know? It's a scary it's, environment, it's, but we, know, we don't do enough of that, you know? We don't do enough of, of informing people about their full self to create a better career for themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and and to add on what you're saying, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Kelly, it's just like purpose, you know, like that's one thing I've been very, very, uh, very cognizant of during COVID is like purpose, right? Like we lack, that, the purpose gives you the direction. And a lot a lot of us have been miseducated. I had to reread, like recently I reread uh, Dr. Carter G. Wilson's book, The Miseducation of the Negro. I reread it because I was like, I got to reread this and really get back to some of the fundamental, fundamental things he, he said then that still translate and still relevant, unfortunately, now. And he talked about just, again, like a lot of things that you're saying and our, our, you and I have came to the conclusion of is just like, right, what is your purpose in this society? You know, you're just to get money. You're just, you're really doing yourself a disservice in the, in the long run, you know, as far as quality, quality of life, you know, and recognizing how we've been subjected to seem like we are lesser than our European Caucasian counterparts and that's like you said, that's a system dynamic that plays out in everybody, not just black mm -hmm. folks, but it plays out in white folks, too. You know, as far as limiting themselves, you know, mm -hmm. and who they are. But, it, but it's a weird game. It's a weird paradox. You know, when you really get into it, it's just like it just creates this imbalance. You know, it yeah. creates this imbalance. And but people normalize the imbalance. That's the crazy. Yeah, part. that's. The that but the idea we're trying to break up. Uh, everyone. But the idea is to free oneself sorry, sorry. of the existence. You know, free oneself for the, the true existence because we, as a people, need them to be that great engineer, that great doctor, that great mm -hmm. artist, that great lyricist, that great builder or architect. So we need that. But by you limiting them, not speaking of the diversity that has to be off, that's available to them, that they can, you know, they can do it. They can just go out and be that great person. You know, you know what's so scary about it is that we have these um these like um these progressive schools, colleges and universities, and they're built just on that. Meaning if you build something, don't be afraid to tear it down. You can build a perfect structure, but don't be afraid to tear it down. And most people are are not comfortable with that concept of destroying something that they put a lot of time and energy into to destroy it mm -hmm. and grow it back better. Most people don't have that because they have a level of consistency and insecurity as opposed to creativity and drive and vision. That's a totally different mindset. And how yeah. do we bring everybody to that drive and mindset? To destroy, to rebuild is the, is the highest degree of confidence, you know? 
that you're going to take away your security, mm. take away everything you thought you was about, and start from nothing and go again. Because all you have is your hopes and your dreams. But once it's well placed, and you have a problem, it becomes routine. Because that's what they used to do in most societies here. You know, Some of the ancient societies still do it. They will destroy everything just to rebuild it. And they rebuild it with a different mindset. And, and, and anything that was here before, hell with it. It's about this. You know, and it goes on and on, you know. But when you're looking at careers for our kids, the philosophy has to start differently. The philosophy has to be like, you're not going to be doing this career for the next 20 or 30 years. You're going to, I mean, just this career. You may be doing three or four other things in lieu of just this career. So if you're going to be an engineer, you also may have to be an EMT, uh, volunteer fire department type people, or you may be doing some stuff with, um, you know, energy, green energy. You're going to be doing a little bit more. And that's what's going to make you a full person. And a lot of people suffer from issues like mental health issues because they're partly put in the box. Mental health comes from you being in an environment that you're very uncomfortable with, and your only way is to self-medicate, uh, so isolate or to become depressed, as opposed to just freeing yourself and then just allowing the world to be the world. You should be fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This has been a so, great talk, buddy. It is, it is. And then before we end, I definitely want to give a shout out uh, to the people who are watching. You know, give thanks. You know, definitely have, if you have any comments or questions while we're on, you know, definitely put them down in the chat. Uh, also want to give a definitely a special shout out because you know it's Black History Month. You know I got my shirt on, my good good friend of mine. <laughs> Del- Col- Del- what? Yeah, Col- Coleman. Yeah, uh, Coleman. Uh, Coleman Neal out of out of Memphis. You know out of in town. Mm. Black entrepreneur. He Whoa, you know okay. he's a, he's a film speaking on which he's a filmmaker. He's a fashion designer, and you know he has his own uh, uh, lawn care service, landscaping yeah. service. So shout out to Del Guan Coleman. I'm gonna definitely bring him on and talk. He has his own platform. But that's what I'm talking about. Like, like this is a black designer. This brother made this with his company, mm-hmm. quality material, quality fashion design, mm-hmm. and he's doing multiple things and he's doing them well. And he and and he doesn't have the idea of I can't. He's saying if I like it, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna do it. And if it flourishes, cool. If not, I'm gonna go to something else. You know. Yeah, but the idea is that you have to wish people never to get complacent with wealth. Because what happened is when we become wealthy, we become complacent. So let's say if his clothing line blows up, he's gonna drop everything else, right? And that's I not the way. I don't know. I don't think so. Don't so think. the idea is that when your clothing lines, be it good or bad, you know, you're still gonna be keeping the product going, but you may have to look at it. We have to revisit it in a different way. Mm-hmm. But you also doing other things, and right. that's what I recommend. Or inroads instructors or coordinators or program anyone deal with Nesby, any kind of um, career internship and placement. My word for them is this: make sure that you don't talk to that one that child about that one career. You make sure that that child see vision in their career, meaning that they're going to be doing this, but they're also going to be able to realize some other talents in the future. You know, you don't, you're not just going to be a nurse. You're not going to just be a doctor or a lawyer. You're going to be a soul, something more than that. And, and and the fact that you are something more, you lend yourself to a wider audience of people, thus making us as a community a much better people. You know, Because the goal is for you to, your job is to impact society, not to impact your boss's bottom line. Mm. That's what your job is supposed to be about. And if most of us get lost in that translation, the fact is, oh, I'm doing what I would love to do. No, it's not. You're doing what you're trained to do. What you love to do is something that comes for free. And it, and it doesn't make you wealthy, but it makes you happy and it makes you satisfied. And that's what life is all about. And if you, and, and I hate to say this because it's one guy I talk about all the time. He said, I wish you never to exceed, uh, achieve wealth in any of your endeavors, mm. monetary wealth, but I wish you to uh, achieve satisfaction in everything you do, which he was basically saying that you don't think that wealth should preclude you because it does. It shuts you down. It makes you mm-hmm. think that you're more than somebody than you really name. But if you never make that wealth, but you're always satisfied and you're always pursuing, that's life in its true sense. Mm. Bars. Bars. <laughs> you got to be, be thinking, ooh, family, I hope y'all heard that. Uh, definitely something to ponder on. You know, that is. 
you know, I appreciate you, Professor Kelly, man. This has been a wonderful discussion, my brother. Um, I appreciate your time. You know, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your energy. I appreciate you as a as a as a, a mentor, just you know, colleague, and you know, put, putting out doing great work with you, your family, the community. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, you know, thank you for your time, man. <laughs> and I thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts and ideas, and hopefully they can be, um, you know, taken up. I hope these uh, individuals going into these careers can move in those directions to become a whole person, you know, because we need them as society, because we suffer as a society, because we have people who are ill-equipped to deal with society challenges. And they are there. We can, we can do it, but, you know, we just have to grow that population. Indeed. Okay, but thank Indeed. you. I appreciate it. And definitely, I appreciate y'all. So thank you all for watching, for listening. Definitely uh, subscribe. I'll, I'll be posting this probably on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can hit me up, Kyle Dixon, Mr. Kyle Dixon on YouTube. Check out my Grand Rising Collective podcast with my other host colleague, uh, Kyle Bentley. Grand Rising Collective podcast on YouTube, IG. And uh, on that note, family, you know, dare to be great. You know what I'm saying? Black History Month is just one month, but we excellent every single damn day. All right. Yes, I said it. All right. So peace and blessings, y'all. Have a good one and keep it, keep it moving and stay tuned with us. We got more coming. Peace.